even 40 years after the Bell Witch Haunting residents in and around Adams Station, Robertson County, Tennessee, lived under the shadow of the tales of what had happened to the Bell family. A man named Charles Smith was shot and killed for displaying some of the same phenomena as young Betsy Bell, the target of the so-called witch. However, the connection between Charles and Betsy seems tied by familiar spirits that resided in the area. In the summer of 1867, Thomas Clenard and Richard Burgess were working lumber for 65-year-old farmer H. Fletcher in Springfield, just outside of the infamous Adams Station, where the Bell Witch was said to have resided in the home of John Bell Sr. Their other co-worker, Charles Smith, was, according to them, some sort of sorcerer who decided seemingly for no reason to torment them with his supernatural abilities. They said that Charles was a fortune teller who bragged about being able to spell anyone and soon after Thomas and Richard were tortured nightly by visions of great horses and what they described as hobgoblins while in their quarters. They said that Charles was also a ventriloquist which has similarities to the accusations of fraud leveled against Betsy Bell decades earlier. The earliest accounts of what would become known as the Bell Witch Haunting in 1817 didn't include poltergeist activity later written about, but that young Elizabeth Bell, also known as Betsy, had somehow learned ventriloquism. On October the 19th, 1820, military officer John R. Bell crossed the Red River at Port Royal, Tennessee, and had dinner at the house of a family with the last name of Murphy in Robertson County. He documented what the family had told him concerning the strange goings on at the Bell home nearby. Rather, a singular circumstance was here related to me of a young girl of about 15 years of age residing but three miles from Murphy. A voice accompanies her which says she should marry a man, a neighbor. Thousands of persons have visited her to hear this voice. In many instances, it will reply to questions put to it. The visitors have left as little satisfied in their curiosity as before they heard it. Many are under the impression that it is ventriloquism, imposed upon the hearers either by the girl or her brother, who it seems is generally in her company. Her family is respectable. In January of 1856, the Saturday Evening Post ran an article and stated the voice was ventriloquism by Betsy. The article continues by saying that the voice would only begin speaking after nightfall and only when all of the lights in the home were extinguished. The article didn't explain how the voice could sound like it was coming from any place in the home, as if suddenly moving around in the darkness. It also implied that Betsy had employed the alleged trick to win the affections of Joshua Gardner. It didn't address the amazing ability the voice had to openly declare the secrets of those who came to visit. Instead, it documented that after Joshua married another, the voice vanished. Stories about Charles don't record under the conditions his co-workers heard the voice that seemingly followed Charles since they weren't lodging with him. It could be that they heard this voice that seemed to follow Charles while on the job site in the light of day. The phantom images that Thomas and Richard said that Charles had somehow created and their odd appearances isn't likely to have been inspired by any later outside sources. Outlining tales of the Bell Witch in Nashville's Centennial Exposition in 1880, it was documented that this so-called witch that haunted the Bell family could appear as a rabbit, a black bear, and a black hound. It went on to say that the voice could imitate the sounds of various animals and gave three names to itself, saying at different times that its name was either Three Waters, Tiny Purdy, or Black Dog. It would be in later writings that the appearance were presented as more chimeric. It was said that the haunting began because John Bell Sr. had seen a monstrous creature with the body of a hound and the head of a rabbit and shot at it. This hound, appearing with black fur, would continue appearing to family members and their slaves. Sometimes it would appear as having two heads or no head at all. Young Drury Bell apparently spotted an impossibly large bird perched on a fence staring at the house once. Betsy herself said that she had seen a young girl in a green dress swinging from the branches of an oak tree in their backyard. Charles didn't draw crowds like Betsy. Instead, he inspired fear. One morning, after having enough of their nightly frights, Thomas and Richard confronted Charles on the job. The September the 21st, 1868 Courier-Journal newspaper article from Louisville, Kentucky, where this event was recounted, didn't go into detail about the argument, but Charles left allegedly vowing to murder his co-workers. 
On September the 9th, 1869, Charles and a man named Morgan, originally from Davidson County, Tennessee, were seen walking through town on the Edgefield and Kentucky Railroad tracks that ran from Guthrie, Kentucky, to the Edgefield community on the northern outskirts, present-day Nashville. Allegedly, they were wearing disguises and carrying pistols. After learning about this, Thomas and Richard rode after his old co-worker and the stranger. It seems that Thomas had had a string of bad luck or unwelcome experiences since he had confronted Charles on their job site because he believed that Charles had cursed him and he wanted revenge. It would later be revealed in court that Thomas and Richard were carrying rifles and Thomas said his only intention was to arrest Charles so that the man could stand trial for witchcraft. However, Charles was shot and killed on the spot by Thomas and the two men were arrested. The stranger going by the name of Morgan was brought in for questioning. Dewey Edwards' 2019 book, Execution of Murder, Robertson County, Tennessee Murder Cases, 1810-1910, reveals that Thomas and Richard were indicted on October the 6th and their trial took place on March 9, 1870. James E. Rice was the presiding judge. Their attorney argued a case of witchcraft that frightened the jury to the point where they were acquitted of murdering Charles and released. The image of a witch with her black cat as a familiar is widely inaccurate. A familiar wasn't a pet, it was a supernatural entity that could take on multiple visual forms. Typically, they appeared as animals with something not quite right about the image they've chosen to take on, such as deformity or a combination of characteristics from different animals. There were instances where they could appear as human or a humanoid shape as well, excluding the entries about them in the 15th century witch hunting manual, the Malus Melficarum. They were known to appear to people while going about their daily task. Often, the person they appeared to were undergoing some prolonged hardship and according to lore would offer magical powers. However, they could be problematic. They could appear at very inopportune times. They also could speak as a disconnect voice and which anomalous cognition reveal events that were taking place far away or the secrets of people, sometimes without warning. To a skeptical witness, this can only be explained away as ventriloquism. Thank you.